ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome. We are only running three minutes behind, so that's very good. Uh, Malaysian companies are increasingly taking the next steps to becoming global businesses. They are moving beyond merely shipping their goods abroad. They are setting up operations overseas. Uh, but the act of reaching across borders, whether you're outsourcing or looking to expand into new markets, can be intimidating. Uh, the Economic Transformation Program's Global Malaysia series speaks to those titans of industry who have made the bold leap into the great unknown in an attempt to demystify this process of going global for the rest of us. Um, there is definitely wisdom to be passed on, there are lessons to be learned, and uh, today we have with us none other than Tantri Tony Fernandez. Um, a lot of the time, on occasions such as this, uh, moderators or hosts often begin you know, by saying that this is a man that needs no introduction. It is very rare, however, when a moderator or host actually means that. Uh, from airlines to hotels to insurance companies to mobile networks to Formula One to football to being Malaysia's newest reality TV star, ladies and gentlemen, this man really needs no introduction. So I give you Tansri Tony Fernandez. Uh, so let me tell you how this is all going to work. Uh, we're going to uh, have a quick chat with Tony for about 45 minutes, uh, following which I will invite Dr. Sri Idris Jala, uh, the CEO of Pumandu, up on the stage, and then we'll have a nice little conversation between, I guess, um, two of the most respected technocrats in the country, uh, and we'll see you know, what they have in mind to fix us. Um, but, uh, Tony, I have to say that we actually brought you here under false pretenses. Um, this is not really about Global Malaysia Series. Actually, you're here to respond to 800 AirAsia complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you your mic. <laughs> Don't worry, you have 45 minutes with me. <laughs> I'll get you back. So, um, uh, Tony, I, I thought we'll begin with a little bit about you. I mean, the idea of going global is something that can be quite intimidating. But um, a lot of people know your backstory. I mean, they've read um, hundreds of stories, you know, whether it's in from, from the start to the BBC to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you about, I guess, your own education and, and how that influenced your thinking beyond the shores and what basically made you go, you know what, my backyard isn't big enough for me. Um. Okay, let me go back in time. Firstly, I never realized there were so many people here. Uh, <laughs> so, Pamandu, uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, I think, Malaysia's best minister. And I'm not sucking up to him. Uh, <laughs> as you know, I'm not someone who does that very well anyway. That's why I get myself into lots of trouble. Um, let me, uh, so let me go back in, in terms of going to school. I, I was, I'd never been out of Malaysia. Uh, one day my father comes to me and says, uh, I'm sending you to England to school. So it sounded pretty cool. Um, and uh, literally it was about two or three weeks. And then they took me to Subang Airport, my most favorite airport in the world. <laughs> That's to the Pamandu minister. Uh, <laughs> who when he was at MAS blocked me from using it. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun, I can tell. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those days, uh, when you go to Subang Airport, it was, you know, there was no terrorism and all these things. It was a really nice kind of airport. You could wave to everyone and there wasn't so much security. And I remember I was in my school uniform wearing my unaccompanied minor's badge and, uh, you know, half of the village had come to see me off. So it all felt pretty cool at that time. And uh, I remember, you know, you're walking down the ramp. And you could still wave to people, right? And you, you walk to the plane, similar to you do in AirAsia. But, <laughs> but there's no one waving to you. <laughs> and um, uh, I got on the plane, right? And then at that point, the coolness started to wear off. Like, where am I? Not going to see my parents for a long time. And you arrived in Heathrow Airport, and this was in 1977. And um, Heathrow then was still huge, right? You, you got out of the plane, and you're like, wow, where am I? And the first thing I thought of was, God, everyone's white here. 
Um, I told my daughter you have no such problem because now when you arrive in Heathrow Airport, everyone's Indian. Uh, so you feel quite at home. <laughs> and um, my father was a bit of a lunatic. He gave me 50 pounds and I had to find my own way to school. And I arrived in, in Epsom and then I went up to my school. And I thought, wow, what have I done wrong in my life? It looked like a, a prison camp. But you get on, and, and the great thing about you know, being thrown in the deep end is you either sink or you swim. And I think in, in every experience here, you can never really prepare yourself. You can never prepare yourself to open your company in Thailand. or open, You just got to do it, basically, and you, and you learn along the way, um, and you adapt. And I think uh, the best part of going abroad was just being thrown in the deep end and having to survive. It's, it's really Darwinism. Darwinism is, is fantastic, right? The fittest of the survival, which is what all entrepreneurs have to go through in an unprotected world, uh, which is what globalization is all about, that the best will only survive. Um, and uh, you know, I had five or six great years there. Right. Think, I mean, sink or swim is a very interesting uh, idea uh, given that I'm sure when you decided to take a lot of your companies outside of Malaysia, not just I and even outside of ASEAN, I guess the people around you would have told you it's too risky, it's too complicated, competition is too tough. I mean, I guess you get thrown those catchphrases all the time. And how do you deal with that? I mean, does it take a certain amount of self-confidence and even arrogance in your own belief that you're right? Um, firstly, I go back to your first question. I think sometimes we, we run before we walk. And I never thought about globalization. And globalization is big, but we're still in just ASEAN and a bit of Asia. Um, my most important thing was to be good in our own country first. But once you're good in your own country, and you are good in your own country by your own merits, um, so you're not protected or you haven't had any easy handouts, etc., then you think, okay, um, there's a big wide world out there. And uh, you know, once we kind of established ourselves in Malaysia, we thought, okay, there's an opportunity to take this model outside of Malaysia, and Thailand was next, etc. Um, was there self-confidence? Was there arrogance? No, I think in, in the same way that I think a Utusan reporter asked me when we first started Air Asia, "Will you be here in three months?" I said, "I don't know." you'll have to come and see us in three months. I really don't know. And I didn't know. Because, of course, you started just after 9-11 as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, is there a... Was I going to go to Thailand and, like, I knew we were going to succeed? No, I had no idea. Um, in Indonesia, no. And, and so on and so forth. And we haven't succeeded in Japan. You know, that was a, 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 a disaster by any stretch of the imagination. That was, like, two very, very opposite people um, trying to go to bed together, and it, <laughs> and, it, and it failed. But so there is no recipe. But, you know, if you don't try, you don't know. And I think as Malaysians, you know, we... Let me go back a bit, right? So um, I said earlier in the interview, you know, you, from the moment I came out of my mother's womb, I was supposed to be a doctor. Of course, we all right? are. Yeah. yeah, you know, <laughs> Malaysian, I had a stethoscope around me uh, when I came out of my mother. And I was programmed. So us Malaysians sometimes get pre-programmed. Um, and I think for all you parents out there, please don't tell your kids to be doctors, lawyers, etc. Tell them to be like Idris and uh, <laughs> go change this country. Um, and that, I think, is one of our problems, you know, Malaysian parents will push their kids into one direction. Entrepreneurism may not be the right direction. You know, professional career is always looked at. And then we're a bit risk averse and we spend our time looking at the negatives. There are a hundred reasons why we shouldn't do it as opposed to why we should. So if you, if you think about my life, right, it's everything I've done is contrary. So I was in the music business, and then I suddenly got bored and said, I'm going to start an airline. Now, can you imagine the advice Malaysians were giving to me? 
And if I listened to that advice, I wouldn't be here. I'd still be fighting pirates in Chinatown. Um, right. and, and I'm sure no one who's come to this convention has ever bought a pirated CD. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you've got to take risks and but, you've got to break the norm. But, of course, isn't that where the self-assurance and the, I guess, I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, arrogance in the best way. Um, and it goes into the psychology of empire building as well, which is essentially what you've done in many ways because you've expanded. And, and while the businesses are connected, they're at the same time not. Um, no, the businesses are very connected. Um, I wouldn't say we take a conglomerate approach, which I think many Malaysian companies do. They just put their hands in lots of businesses. I think focus is key in expansion. My job is AirAsia. That's what I do every day. Um, I'm an investor in a group of companies that have the AirAsia principles. So, you know, we want to serve the underserved. So, Tune Hotel is serving a budget market, Tune Insurance, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, Focus, I think, is very key, and my job every day is, is AirAsia, and that's what I do. Now, when you're, you're, you're investing in these group of companies that share the AirAsia principle, and of course, a lot of that is, I guess, Tony's principles as well. Um, and, you know, in, glowing, in going global, I think brand, I guess, Tony Fernandez has helped a lot. Um, and I know a lot of people, I guess, who have faith in your companies as well because of you. Uh, and this, I'm going to put you in the hot seat at the moment. And how does brand Tony Fernandez work in conjunction with brand Malaysia, which helps you more when you're going global? I don't understand the question. <laughs> uh, oh, you know, you know what? We're going to come back to that when Idris joins us. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Firstly, I mean, um, I think... That's a very good question, which I'm going to twist. Us Malaysians rely on the government too much. We never have, because many of the times we've been fighting against the government. Right. Um, and so, you know, we want to be spoon-fed the whole time. But we don't get off ourselves and say, let's do it ourselves. So, you know, we didn't go to any government organization for branding help or grants or whatever. We probably wouldn't have got it anyway. But the issue is that You've got to go out there and do it. And I think um, brand Tony Fernandez, brand AirAsia, whatever, whenever you see a Google article or something, they'll always refer to me as a Malaysian. Yeah. Right? And that's because I always make sure people know I'm a Malaysian. You know, we're very proud to be Malaysian. I think the great thing about being Malaysian is Malaysian. We're a very unique country that has such diversity. I don't think we celebrate it enough. We spend so much time on the wrong aspects of uh, the diversity we have as opposed to the positive aspects. And um, so having Malaysian behind you, because of what a Mal you know, when I, uh, when I went to England, no one knew Malaysia. I used to have to say Malaysia's in between Thailand and Singapore. Singapore. That's not the case anymore because of the, the, whether it's F1, whether it's Twin Towers, whether it's other Malaysians have gone global, people know Malaysia now. So it certainly has not deterred. It's helped tremendously being Malaysian. But ultimately, it's irrelevant whether you're Malaysian or American or British or Thai or whatever. You've got to go out there and build your brand yourself, and, and Malaysia can assist you by helping. And I think it's more the companies that drive it, because I think a, a second Malaysian company following at the back of us has an easier time. Yeah. Because, and I, and I hope that AirAsia will inspire many of these people in this room um, that things can be done. Right. Um, so if you go into, a Malaysian company goes into Thailand and says, you know, well, we're Malaysian, like AirAsia, like AirAsia. or CIMB, or whatever, then it's going to help. So um, definitely attaching yourself to Malaysia will help other Malaysians. And predecessing us, Malaysia was already becoming well-known, so it helped. But when, with regards to Brand Tony, on the other hand, um, what does that mean for, I guess, your succession plans, or when you leave other people in charge of your different companies or, or invested companies, when you're going yeah, I'm global? Yeah, very, I'm very 
What do you say when I grow old? Oh, no, no, when, you, when, you, when you're going global, when you're going global. <laughs> I'm going to leave now. Um, um, no, I think it's very important. I think if you see, and we've done it, we don't talk about it, right? Um, Kamaruddin and myself and Dato Parmin and Aziz, we started this company, but we're all moving on. We've got Irene now, who is the, the CEO. And uh, it's very important. I think Asian companies fail a lot on this succession planning. I think people stay too long in positions, um, and they, they think they're invincible. And organizations need to be refreshed, whether political, whether companies, et cetera. You know, when I, when I retire from AirAsia, I won't be senior or mentor or anything like that. Right. <laughs> I will go. But, okay. um, you know, you, like you said, you've got very capable CEOs um, under your wing. But when you go global, say, you know, when you went to India, for example, it was Tony Fernandez, the rock star, which they wanted to see. And I guess that goes a long way in opening up doors. And would your CEOs currently still have that same pull? Um, or is it a lot yeah, easier I think Azran's got a pull. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think he created, <laughs> he created a few storms. Um, <laughs> thunderstorms. <laughs> Bigger than I ever have. <laughs> um, so I think Irene, everyone, you know, obviously it's a big shadow, right? Because I'm involved in many things, right? Yeah. Both good and bad. Um, but uh, I think we have very good CEOs and the ability. And I take it, see, people mis misread it. And the only person who really understood it, it was Idris, actually, and he had a speech. Um, do you know, when Irene became CEO, you've got to let them be CEO. So I moved out of Malaysia. I went to Jakarta. Because if I was still here, then she would not grow. She would just be a messenger. I mean, she is now the boss. And I'm in Jakarta, not because I'm abandoning Malaysia or anything, but if we really want to be an ASEAN company, I want to be sitting right next door to the ASEAN Secretary General so I can push the ASEAN agenda. And I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And I think this is where we got to, you know, the reaction to us moving to Jakarta shows that Malaysia needs to mature a little bit because it's a Malaysian company that's making moves to becoming more global. Yeah. Um, and I think Idris said it once when I got an award somewhere. He said, you know, in 10 years' time, if you're all not globalized companies, you won't be sitting in front of me. The top 300s was an edge award. And so we must stop being parochial. We must look beyond our shores. It doesn't change my DNA. I'm Malaysian. That will never change. You know, unless Idris strips my citizenship. Um, I don't think even he can do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, that will never change. So we've got to, you know, we've got to, we've got to look beyond our shores. And we have to take some risks sometimes to go beyond our shores. But going back to your point, succession planning is, is really key. And um, that's why we have Irene there, we have Azran, we have Taspon in Thailand, and uh, so on and so forth. So I guess... And if you go by Indian CEO, yeah. I don't go to India anymore. He's now doing all the... You know, he looks like a Bollywood film star anyway. <laughs> so I said, I told him at a press conference, I said, in five years' time, if you look like this, you'll be fired. <laughs> um, because then the stress wasn't good enough, right? I mean, he spends all his time with his hair. Uh, he, doesn't he, he refused to wear an AirAsia cap. I almost fired him on the spot <laughs> because he thinks he doesn't look good, but he's really smart. Again, as a lesson here, we break the mold. He was the headhunter who was looking for a CEO for us. Right. And we said, hey, why don't you be the CEO? <laughs> You're really smart. Now, that's breaking conventional uh, thought processes, right? And he's going to be awesome, and he'll be a rock star. I, I have no doubt about it. He's very smart. He's, he's, he's young. He's 33. And um, so, you know, I think letting go is important yeah. in your company to making sure that there is strong succession planning. So just to, I guess, get the conversation a little more general, because uh, a lot of people here, I think, also come from companies that, are looking to go global. Now, uh, in your opinion, who do you think should do that? You know, in the past, I guess, in the past couple of decades, it was always, or two decades ago, rather, it was always, you know, the domain of a Fortune 500 company. Only they could afford to go global. Um, is that still the case? Do you think no, that... No, I think that's, that's rubbish. And I think, first of all, let's define global, 
right? I mean, I don't think Air Asia will ever be all over the world. I don't think that's Do our. Well, I mean, no, I, I don't think so. Maybe, um, but I don't think there'll be an Air Asia Brazil. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, but whether we fly to Brazil, Brazil? maybe, maybe <laughs> at that point I'll retire definitely. If I can play football on In the Brazil. beach, Copacabana <laughs> with Idris. Um, who looks seven kilos lighter now, unfortunately. I think, I think 17. 17 right? kilos. Yeah. Wow, the pressure <laughs> of being in the Malaysian government. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't believe it's a diet. <laughs> it's all those cabinet meetings. <laughs> um, no, I think, let, let's, let's put two things in perspective. One is, um, our business, I think, will be Asia-centric. And that's pretty big already. I would love to be a global brand. I would love, I mean, my dream is, and this is a lofty dream, by the way, but we got a dream that people would know AirAsia as much as Coca-Cola. Then, you know, very hard because we won't be operating in every country. But there are two defined. Our business focus will very much be Asia. We may fly all over the world, but um, focus is Asia. Maybe in terms of knowledge is very important. Can I just digress a little bit on your, on your talk? I think it's so important about branding. I think us Malaysian companies do not um, focus on branding. We're very P&L driven, right? So you spend 10,000, you want to see your return straight away. I think that's where in the West they do things better. They um, invest in the brand. AirAsia wouldn't have gone from 200,000 passengers 12 years ago to 44 million passengers without branding. Am I right in thinking it's currently the world's largest airline, AirAsia? No, no, no. Not yet. Not by, by far, no. Okay. I think we're number four in Asia in terms of passengers. But okay. we make the most money. But, but most planes? Uh, no. No, okay. no, no, no. It's not about size. Uh, it's about the bottom line. <laughs> uh, not the size of the stick, it's the magic Correct. in the bond. But, but I say branding is, is so critical. And I mean, we did some bold moves, right? We were a little Malaysian company, and we went out and sponsored Manchester United. Yeah. Now, that is a painful decision, because I hate that football club. <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> but you've got to be a prostitute once in a while. And, you know, can you imagine? We had seven planes, seven all 737s. But we had the balls to go out there and sponsor Manchester United. And when me and Cameroon went to the Theatre of Dreams, or whatever stupid name they call it, <laughs> um, Old Trafford or whatever, <laughs> I never watched the football. I was watching AirAsia on the banner, right? <laughs> like me and Cameroon were real kampong boys. Hey, AirAsia, AirAsia. <laughs> Every time our logo came out. But can you imagine seven planes, an unknown brand, and we're on the same billboard as Vodafone, Budweiser, Audi, some of the biggest brands. That, I think, was confidence, that we didn't care. We didn't care anyone saying, I can, who, who are you, AirAsia? Yeah, yeah. Many people did. But that's how we built the brand. You know, when we did Formula One, uh, when we sponsored the referees. And I'll tell you a story about the referees and how we pushed the branding so hard, right? So we went out, and this is where you take globalization away, you've got to believe us Malaysians are as good as anyone else in the world. So we were competing with Emirates for the referee sponsorship. And Emirates had like a gazillion dollars more than us, right? So I did a big speech to the Premier League. I said, you've got to, you've got to support us, right? Because Malaysians have been watching football from the year dot. And there's like one person in Dubai who watches football. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's English. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, didn't make too much of a difference. Then I said, you have to support us because us Malaysians have been fixing all your games for the last 30 years. 30 years, yeah. <laughs> you know, you want to know a globalized industry minister is the bookies. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysia controls it. Um, and they're all in East Malaysia. So, <laughs> and that didn't work. And then I finally said, I said, look, I want to sponsor the red card as well. And so they looked at me like, what do you mean the red card? I said, yeah, yeah I want to have airasia.com on the, on red, the red card. card. 
And I went, what do you mean? I said, yeah, when Wayne Rooney gets sent off, that <laughs> picture's all over the world. And it will say airasia.com. You just want to be the one sending off Wayne Rooney. And then on the <laughs> other side, I want to do more than that to Wayne Rooney, <laughs> um, especially if he's going to Chelsea. And on the other side, it'll say, now you're suspended, have a holiday with AirAsia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they loved it. They said, you know, we, we love your energy, we love it, okay, we'll give you the sponsorship. And that three years with the referees was right. fantastic. The last year being the most painful when QPR had the most number of players sent off. Right. Uh, <laughs> by the referees who we sponsored. But you've got to believe in yourself, going back. Yeah. It's not arrogance, it's not confidence. It's just saying, well, we Malaysians are as good. And I think sometimes that's our, our weakness. We put ourselves down, you know, as opposed to let's go out there. And yeah, we're not as big, but you've got to start somewhere. And uh, we, pushed, we pushed the envelope. But of course, not everything was as, uh, I guess not all of your sponsorship ventures were as successful. I mean, you did, was it the Oakland Raiders? Yeah, no, that was really successful. Can you imagine a Malaysian company <laughs> sponsoring an American football team, right? And but how did that, because there's about one person who watches American football. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't yeah. do it for this room. Yeah. Uh, this room already knew me, or knew AirAsia. Yeah. It's the hundreds of thousands of Filipinos and Latinos and all these people who didn't know AirAsia. And we painted a plane right. in the Oakland Raiders colors. And... Uh, you know, Azran and me, <laughs> amazing, right? I mean, when you go out onto American football field, I mean, these guys are big. I mean, they're really big. I thought they were going to use me as the football. Um, <laughs> but, you know, suddenly 50,000 people in California knew AirAsia, and it grew from there. So it's about, you know, doing things a little bit different. The Richard Branson bet, I mean, you know, that was a bit of a joke at first. But if, if an advertising agency who does all these things, especially when they do the campaign, yeah. and when they don't, they don't measure it. If you added up the media value that AirAsia got from that from one that stunt, one event. Yeah. unbelievable, actually. Unbelievable. And, but wherever you see it, they will mention AirAsia, Malaysia, et cetera, et cetera. But now when going into these, I guess, the lion's den in a different country, whether it's in Jakarta, whether it's in... Um, in England, in the US, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of these negotiations, I guess that's what frightened a lot of companies as well, because a lot of people don't know how much to leave on the table. And you seem to be very good at that. Uh, very good at that. So if you could share some secrets, I guess, on, 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 on negotiating with seven different governments, because every government's got its own little... You trained hard in Malaysia. <laughs> uh. <laughs> So dealing with the Indonesian government or after Malaysia is damn easy. <laughs> uh, uh, Idris is so really <laughs> looking forward to this conversation. Uh, he's part of the training. <laughs> <laughs> when he was MAS CEO, Garuda CEO is no problem, man. <laughs> um, no, I think it's a myth. You know, it's like a myth, like Indian bureaucracy. Hmm. Everyone says, oh, don't do business in India because of Indian bureaucracy. I mean, I haven't seen it so far, right? You just got to go out there and engage. You know, it, it is, a, I mean, it's the one place in the world it's good to be Indian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they like me over there. So, um, but, you know, I haven't seen anything. So again, don't be put off by press or BFM or Star <laughs> or all these publications, right? Um, you. Until you go out there, you don't know, right? So, you know, you see a beautiful woman and you think all kinds of things when you see her, right? But until you talk to her, you, you don't know, right? You see Idris, and you think he's a guy from Barrio. Um, but then there's so much substance behind it. When I used to walk around the airport, we dressed down in AirAsia. I dressed up today. and uh, But we dressed down, we were jeans and t-shirts. Yeah. I do it for one reason. Um, one is, well, two reasons. But the main reason is, if you dress up in a suit and a tie, you put a distance between yourself and your staff. When you look worse than them, then they <laughs> feel very easy to approach you and talk to you, right? The downside is Malaysian airports think I'm an illegal Bangladeshi. <laughs> um, that's just <laughs> jumped off a Biman flight. 
<laughs> but, you know, actually, MAB would probably want to do more to me than that. <laughs> but um, the key is, is there the are lots of little facets into making sure that you, you maximize yourself. And don't, so don't, don't put these barriers in front of you before you even go there. So it isn't a different strategy for a different country? Yeah, slightly. But, you know, I think you have to embrace... You ha you I, actually, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's all the same. One, do you pr I think the most important thing is, do you provide value to that economy? Right. I think if you're bringing jobs, if you're bringing economic development to the country, you're on a plus already, right? Um, you know, we're all looking for foreign investors and stuff, so Malaysian companies are no different. So I think when you're selling your, your company, are you, the most important thing I think to most government is job creation. Are you creating jobs? And I think if you're on that, then governments are gonna be much open to you. Right. Um, I think the day and age of protectionism is, is slowly dying. So if you can provide value to the people as well, so if you provide a service that's providing value to the people, then, you know, great. It must be reciprocated as well, I mean, if you're in a regulated business. So what was the situation with Japan then, in the sense that, was oh, it Japan, a consumer nothing. level No, issue, consumers or? were fine. I mean, you know, AirAsiaX is doing fantastic. Our loads were good. We just, um, the government was fantastic. And we'll go back to Japan. Just we were culturally, between A&A &A and us, was really, really, really different. We just were different. Um, you know, it's like a homosexual and a straight. We were just <laughs> completely different types of people. Right. An uh, auditor, and uh, as I see my, my auditor over here. Actually, I should stop there now. He's waving his finger at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, so when it comes to building your brand, and let's talk about AirAsia for a second. Um, and I guess there's sometimes a disconnect between what you're trying to do and I think the perceptions of the government, for example. So let's take the most recent fiasco with regards to uniforms. Um, Airage uniforms, shirts, skirts are too short, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they need to change the uniform. Now, when you're thinking about something like that, I mean, of course, you've considered that. I mean, in many ways, an ambiguous, non-culturally referenced uniform is probably good for going global. It's less offensive in many ways, people don't take, any, um, people don't take any, anything away from it. And to be fair, the Kabaya girl and uh, both Singapore and Airlines and Malaysian Airlines cashed in on the sexiness of a Kabaya because that's what white people like. So, you know, <laughs> it's, a different, it's a different thing. So how do you respond to something like that when they say, culturally, you're not meeting our cultural standards? I don't respond. <laughs> I don't think you saw a response from me. I didn't, yeah. Very clearly, we couldn't use a Kabaya in Japan. You know, right. we, we couldn't, right? So, you know, when I met the Prime Minister of Thailand, he said the greatest thing about AirAsia is its brand and its name, AirAsia. He said the worst thing about Singaporean brands is they have Singapore in front of everything, right? right. So, you know, it's Development Bank of Singapore, Singapore Press Holdings, etc. Now, it's hard. There's a little bit of a nationalistic reaction. So. You know, if you really want us to go global, which every politician says so, then you must support us. And, and you have to look beyond our shores and beyond some of our cultural sensitives. We, we used a uniform that would appeal to everybody, right? And yes, it was in the back of my mind that I'd like to be in other parts of Asia. So that's why I used not a batik or anything like that. Um, I used something that I thought would be accepted uh, universally. Um, so, you know, but these things are, you're going to, you know, when you're a big brand, you're going to attract detractors mm. from, you know, not everyone's going to love you. But you just got to be very determined in what you're trying to do. Um, well, we'll talk more about, I guess. You know, if you go back, when we, our uniform is very important for many reasons. It, it, it's, it's really important. It's really important in the identity of the airline. Number one, I didn't design the uniform. I got the cabin crew to design it. Right. I said, this is your uniform. You're going to spend most of your time working there. You design the uniform so you don't complain to me later. 
So the cabin crew designed it themselves, number one. Number two, we want people to be individuals. If you look at a Singapore Airlines stewardess, they all look the same, right? They're all manufactured in Down to the hair Topayo yeah. somewhere, right? Same bun in the hair, same lipstick, same nail polish, same fake smile, right? <laughs> now, I can't tell a crew how to dress, how to look, what hair, down, up, bun, whatever, right? They should know, and guys as well, they should know how best to look. We want to create individuals, not clones. And we want to give people the freedom to choose how they look than they are more themselves. And I think that is one of the successes of AirAsia, that we've created 10,000 individuals with a brain, with an ability. I have 10,000 brains working for me as opposed to 10,000. Uh, 10 brains at the top, and yeah. the rest are implemented. And drones, yeah. Um, just talking about, you know, yet again, this idea of policy and, and governments and even even um, regional-wide policies. Now, with things like ASEAN, you know, you've got um, open skies, apparently, apparently, in two years, uh, ASEAN Economic Community in 2015 and all of this stuff. But um, do you actually plan based around these things? Or, um, no. no, because I, mean, I think ASEAN is moving tremendously in the right direction, yeah. but I think but of course it's consensus. I think so industry no has anything. to drive. If there were no ASEAN brands, why should the government change? Right? I think we wait. Industry must drive change. So whether it's Earth, CIMB, Genting, you know, YTL, etc., there are many brands that are are pushing the barrier and creating ASEAN and Asian um, powerhouses, and that. Invigorate, and also from the other way, whether it's San Miguel, you know, buying our petrol stations yeah. here, etc., um, that creates um, government saying, "Hey, there's something happening here." You know, my dream is that there'll be an ASEAN stock market, that there'll be ASEAN free flow of capital and free flow of labour, um, and I'm a, a big driver of that change. And we shouldn't be afraid because from a 25 million market, we'll get to a, a 600 million market. And I'm so open, right? I mean. When Lion Air opened here, if Tiger Air wants to open here, it makes no difference, provided we have equal access on the other side and let the best man win. If you really want to be global, you've got to compete with everyone, as long as there's a level playing field, right? And um, to me, it's much more exciting looking at a 600 million market than 25 million. And I think Malaysia is so uniquely balanced to capture all of that because of our cultural diversity. AirAsia, what you haven't asked me so far, we've been able to grow, you know, everywhere really quickly. Because I go to India, I have all types of Indians in AirAsia, right? Yeah. Some who speak Punjabi, some who speak Tamil, whatever. Same in China. Um, and then we have Malays who have ancestors from Padang, from yeah. Ujang Pandang, Sulawesi, etc. And that all helps, you know, when you go to a country and you have some cultural identity, the bond is closer. And that has helped me tremendously. When I go to India, I really don't know my roots, but I've studied them well now. <laughs> and I say, oh, I'm from this part, my mother's from this village here, etc., right. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. So we need to build on that, and that's a, that's a real strength. Uh, before I get Idris up here, I was going to well ask you a question which he can possibly respond to. Uh, when it comes to things like, I guess policy, governments, and all of this stuff. What keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Um, I mean, I said this at uh, really at one of Idris's ETP sessions with with the public. Government should facilitate business, not be involved in business. That is the major problem. There's a big, there's a big confusion here between, you know supporting private ventures or GLCs. Um, we still have many civil servants sitting on the boards of GLCs. And you know, there's nothing wrong with a GLC, but they should be, the government shouldn't be favoring them or treating them differently. It should be, um, government should be facilitating business. And whoever is, is good is good. And of course, there are, there are certain advantages GLCs can get. That's not a problem. So my big fear is that we get more involvement from the government in, in business. There should be less involvement. You know, everything Pamandu does is about facilitating business, and that's what it should be. 
right? So infrastructure is facilitating business. Reducing bottlenecks in, in creating business. Ensuring transparency. You know, who really knows what is going on in KLIA2? It is one of the mysteries of the world. <laughs> um, you know, the date moves every few weeks and someone else is always to be blamed. That needs to end and we need to be able to deal with criticism and not say you're anti this or anti that. If we really are to mature as an economy and as a country, we've got to know how to balance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Dr. Sri Idris Jala to the stage. At this stage, I put my cap on. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not confused as technocrats. You see, <laughs> you, see you know, uh, of course, I mean, you know Dr. Sri Idris is CEO of Mando, of course, former CEO of MAS, and they were both rivals. What you don't know, of course, is that you have a Chelsea fan, a West Ham fan, so that makes it even worse. Uh, owner of QPR as well. Where's well, this so guy from? <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, you know, that's a bigger problem. But, um, Idris, um, how would you respond? You know, deep down... We're both musicians. Hey, there you go. And that's why we can still gel together. I'm sure someone's got a guitar. When things got really bad, we play the blues together. When <laughs> things are good, then we play rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, I mean, uh, how would you respond to that? I guess, um, as CEO for Mandu, I mean, um, Tony just said that, you know, government should facil uh, facilitate, not get involved. And I guess your job, in many ways right now, is to build a conducive environment for business, or attempt to, anyway. I agree. I totally agree with Tony that the role of government must be to facilitate rather than to interfere and encroach in, uh, in businesses. So that said, uh, we are have a legacy. The legacy issues is Malaysia grew as a country from low income to middle income, where a lot of businesses, utilities, etc., the government got involved with many of those at that time. But we have to manage those, uh, those legacy issues. Uh, so we have now a program called Government Role in Business to rationalize where the government shouldn't be involved in businesses. We've identified 33 companies, uh, government linked companies, where we'll pay down uh, our stakes in it. At the same time, reduce, uh, uh, maybe exit completely some of them. And so we're already in the process of implementing some of them. I do agree that we do, our role is to facilitate business. This discussion is one of those. The Global Malaysia Series is to facilitate many companies to look beyond our shores. So uh, most people think, why, why is Pumandu in, involved in organizing a thing like this? Because to me, the most important thing now is to make sure that we get the Malaysian companies to think beyond the current shores. Don't get so vortex and embroiled in looking at this small domestic market and quarreling amongst ourselves when the market is huge out there. But Idris, I, when you leave this hall, I guarantee someone will come up to you and go, hey, what is Pumandu doing to help me? Huh? I want to go global. What do you say to them? I always get that. People <laughs> ask me, Idris, are you guys involved in uh, awarding contracts, <laughs> government contracts? Pumandu people don't sit in any body that negotiate nor participate in awarding government contracts. N none of that. Our real job here is to encourage businesses to flourish, to do well, investors to put money here, create jobs, and that's really the, the, the role of Pamandu. Tony, when you announced, I guess there was a lot of pseudo-patriotic rhetoric that came around when you were announcing the move to Indonesia and Jakarta, right? People were writing about that um, at stuff, and now AirAsia X has announced that they're going to set up another hub in uh, Thailand and Indonesia as well. They've got plans. Um, now, um, I guess a question for Idris and then to you was, with AirAsia X expanding in such a way and AirAsia moving out as well, what does it mean for, I guess, Malaysia's ambition to be a regional network hub? What Tony and, and his people are doing, say, setting up offices in Jakarta, that's the right thing to do. Malaysians must learn to accept that when you grow, we want to grow outside Malaysia to other countries. There are times when you have to set offices abroad to make sure you access those markets. And, and, and people must learn to accept that that's part of growing up. When we were all kids, when we lived with our parents, there's time when you have to 
get out from the home and set our own home as well for ourselves. Really, that's, that's the process of growing up. Really, when companies do grow, they will set branches, they will grow, and, and, and that's the right thing to do. And I think I know there was criticism on what Tony was doing when he wanted to create uh, his office in Jakarta, but I think those were very unfair criticism. And, and, and Tony, I guess in Malaysia needs to be competitive, I guess, with um, Indonesia, with Thailand, with, with all the other countries in the region. Um, what, in your opinion, do we, knew, do we need to do then, I guess, whether it's societally or governmentally, to up our game? No, first, first thing, moving to Jakarta, we're Malaysian, right? Yeah. But if you want to be global, you have to make some bold decisions to do things differently. It doesn't change you not being Malaysian. We're still under Bursa Malaysia. We're still a, a Malaysian-owned company. Right. So I, I couldn't understand how people were, you know, I, I thought it would be celebrated. And that's where we have to change this myopic view, right? It, it really is a myopic view and look beyond. And, and that's why it's so refreshing listening to Idris. Um, I forgot your question. Uh, my question was what do we need to do uh, to up our game, but you kind of answered it exactly. Just right. use myopic. One, I mean, I think, I think one is we should embrace change. We shouldn't. Uh, in, in Malaysia, and Malaysian, um, and I think we need to be, we need, to, you know, we need to really say, where are we in the, and be honest with ourselves, where are we in the global league of, whether it's transparency or accountability, or all these these things which Pamandu is very good at doing, right, and really make a change. Education, for instance, right, it's something very very dear dear to me. Um, you can accountants can make anything look good when it's really not good, and they have some of the most ridiculous standards, right. which 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 make things look weird. The reality is, are we good or not? And I think honesty is really important. You know, are we producing good students from our education system in respect? to the rest of the world. When you say, what do we need to do better? It starts with my very first interview. Malaysia is as good as its people. And we've got to make sure that we're producing the best students, whether at primary school, whether at secondary school, whether at tertiary education, um, to, to remain competitive. And, you know, I'm, there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of panels, there's a lot of things that have been put in um, I'm not sure we have improved. And I think honesty is really important in assessing our, our ability to compete going forward. And the world is competitive. You know, I just returned from Myanmar, and they're like, you know, they're years and years and years behind us, but boy, they're going to, they're like accelerating really quickly. And so, you know, I think we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to build on them, we've got to be honest, um, and we've got to celebrate change and, and endorse change as well. Um, you said in an interview, I think in the Jakarta Post, that you said, um, I think Asia will, I think Indonesia will become the center of ASEAN. Uh, most people go to Singapore, I think that's boring and old. The future of ASEAN is in Jakarta, and I want to be a part of it. Now, when we talk about Malaysian companies going global, do you think um, that we get caught up in the sentimentality of the word Malaysian? No, I because don't think, I think so. I that think quote could be taken out of context. No, I think Mal well, yeah, you can, it, I'm sure it did. <laughs> you, can, you can take it however you want to take it. It doesn't change the fact that you're Malaysian, right? It doesn't change that. And um, when I say center of ASEAN, you've got to be real as well. There are 300 million people in Indonesia. Why is China and India always talked about in Asia? Because there are a billion people there. Why am I so much in favor of ASEAN? Because then we have 600 million people. And Malaysian companies have access to a much larger market. Um, and an ASEAN common market gives us the ability to build a domestic market to compete with China and India. Of course. Um, so, you know, I th we definitely have to change our thinking. And it doesn't matter if, if Indonesia does become the center of ASEAN, who cares? As long as all of us in Malaysia benefit from it, right? If we benefit, we're benefiting from China opening up. I think many companies here, here, 19% of AirAsia's revenue comes from China. And that's a huge number. 
That's a huge number. And you know, we invested in China very early when no one else saw the huge potential benefit. So you know, if Indonesia becomes 10 times bigger and Malaysian companies are exporting many more things there and we're creating service industries, many Indonesians come here for school, uh, medical treatment, et cetera. A lot of people from Medan go to Penang, et cetera. That's great. So we shouldn't be really close-minded. If ASEAN grows richer and we can benefit from that, then fantastic.